uh, personal sound check for Kylie. Can I get an okay emoji from the back? I'm getting thumbs up, I'd love to see an okay. All right, I see one okay, I'll take it. Um, this is a common taxonomy of bugs and how to squash them. And I read earlier today, someone said, you know, don't apologize during your presentation, but I need to apologize because I'm, I'm not giving you the full presentation today uh, because the airline lost my luggage, which means that the airline also lost my common taxonomy of bugs and how to squash them outfit. So when you are seeing me present, please don't think about what I'm wearing now. Think about me wearing that, because that's what I'm, I'm meant to be wearing for this. And many people have asked me, do you dress like that all the time? And the answer was yes, um, and so they lost all this. You would have seen me wearing that all days of the conference. Um, all right. So uh, I hope you'll excuse kind of how messy this, this notebook is, because it kind of just is my lab notebook, my field book of uh, case studies and coffee stains and kind of things I've seen while I was out debugging. So getting right into it, uh, let's just level here. Debugging skills are tantamount, right? Like being able to debug is one of the most powerful tools in your like sort of developer toolkit. And adept debuggers seem to be able to debug anything. They can troubleshoot anything, all the way from like uh, ports that are simultaneously open while also refusing connection. That's a fun one. Uh, up to undefined is not a function. And their deft actions make it really easy to believe that uh, debugging just comes from instinct. Um, and it only comes from intuition. So having worked at a previous job on consulting projects um, and then joining a long-running product company, MailChimp, recently, I've heard things like this, kind of like as you familiarize yourself with the application, uh, you'll start to build up some debugging instincts. Um, or even a phrase like this, where just generally it's like, oh, whenever I see something like this happening, maybe I check the logs or uh, I check to see if it's sending like a weird message on exit. Um, how do they know this? Like, how do these adept debuggers know this? They seem like magical creatures, like unicorns, right? Um, they can debug anything, and they seem to always know either the next path to take or the next question to ask. And they reassure you that someday you too will become a magical creature and that you too someday will have debugging instincts. Um, so you can take this at face value and you can write down uh, when X happens, always do Y. Sorry, this is deeply distracting. Um, I don't have control issues, you have control issues. Uh, always good to be very aggressive to the audience, they like that. So, you know, you can believe them and you can write down, you know, when X happens, check Y or, or look here um, and develop your debugging instincts or you can join me on this talk and disabuse yourself of the notion that instincts are magic. Instincts are mystifying. Uh, instincts let us make heroes of each other. And while I think it's totally fine to praise heroic efforts, uh, we shouldn't raise up our teammates as heroes because then we make them the source of truth about our application instead of our code. And we put off the hard work of communicating onto those people instead of writing highly readable code that's very communicable. Um, lastly, unicorns don't scale. You can't just spin up a new instance of your resident unicorn whenever something bad happens. Um, or if you can, open source that because I need it. Um, so let's put away the unicorns for a bit and just look at the statement from earlier again. When you look at it, you might notice something. It's just a conditional, you know? We know how to handle conditionals. Whenever I see X, I always check Y. Uh, Instincts, I believe, and maybe you will too at the end of this talk, are just internalized rule sets. Um, so I wanna take these instincts, kind of convert them to the internalized rule sets, and then start to look at them as patterns instead of something that you'll just magically develop. Uh, Cause that doesn't make any damn sense. So before you get started, you have to agree on some research methods. Um, and the first one is that sometimes containment has to take priority over um, actually squashing a bug. So you just have to contain it and stop it while you can, but you don't have time to figure out what went wrong and how and why just yet. Sometimes we just have to squash it. 
Um, next, we can only work with facts. You can't say, oh, I have a feeling. I've got a gut, gut feeling about this. Um, and then lastly, we can't squash every single bug in this talk. Uh, I submitted a 20-hour talk, and they came back to me and said, just 20 minutes, please. Um, so that's, that's why we can't squash every talk. No, no fault of mine. Um, so what I, what I can do, though, uh, and what's practical, is to show you how to identify bugs by their observable attributes. Um, I know software developers love reinventing the wheel, but we don't have to this time. Um, biologists use a form of taxonomy called phonetics to identify and organize uh, living organisms by their observable attributes and their behavior. Bugs in the natural world can be classified this way, and bugs in the software world can be too. Uh, before we get totally into my field guide, uh, I have to warn you, there are highly uh, contrived, convenient scenarios ahead to help us just focus on talking about finding and observing attributes and then what to do with them. So if we're comfortable with all of that, I'm gonna get started. If you're not, feel free to flee at any time. Um, so let's look at these two major phenotypes of bugs. Uh, we have the upsettingly observable and the wildly chaotic. Upsettingly observable bugs are the ones that kind of make you smack yourself when you see them. You say, how could this have happened? Or shouldn't unit tests have caught this? Or how could this have happened again? <laughs> um, <laughs> they usually live in your code, um, and sometimes they're a result of under-tested or untested. Uh, code. So then we also have wildly chaotic bugs. Um, and these seem to break everything everywhere. Um, you can't reproduce them on your local machine, and you're terrified to produce them on production. Uh, such as, how can this port be open but simultaneously rejecting connection at the same time? It doesn't make sense. Um, so now that we have this kind of baseline set, we can talk about how to squash these two types of bugs. So we've got upsettingly observable bug number one, and these are its observable attributes. Is the bug observable in production? Can it be reproduced locally? Does it, does it seem to be restricted to maybe one area of the application? If you answered yes to both of these bugs, you might have a boar bug on your hands. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the boar bug is named such because, like the boar model of the atom, it's uh, highly deterministic and very simple. When I say deterministic, I mean that for a given input, it always returns the same output. Um, and they're characterized by their repeatability, so you can reproduce it easily, and their reliable manifestation. You know this always causes this to happen. Um, and they're commonly found in uh, code, but sometimes they're found in server. Uh, in, in server code as well. So you find them in uh, kind of anything that has complex branching logic is a good place for uh, an easy boar bug to find out. You see it and you're like, oh, how frustrating, but I know exactly what to do to reproduce it. So it likes to hide in these complex branching functions, um, classes, or config files. So in the wild, you might see this in validation. Um, its validation files are inherently complex a lot of times, so it's easy to write a lot of unit tests around them um, and maybe not do full regression tests. We've all seen, maybe we've not all seen, but many of us have seen the picture of the two doors that open together, but both the handles work, and you can't open either door because they stop each other. Uh, that's aggressively unit tested and not heavily regression tested. Um, so if the consequences of failing validation aren't planned for, they can't be rescued in a meaningful way, um, and they'll fail silently. So the lack of errors will lead you to believe that the save or the submit is functioning fine, and unit testing will lead you to believe that there's no problems with your validation, validation logic. Until, that is, someone needs to send an email or maybe make a purchase, and the UI tells them they're in a good state, but the action, the action that they wish to trigger is never triggered. Um, so, I start with the boar bug because it's the friendliest of bugs and it's the easiest to squash. Um, so we'll squash it first because it provides a model for each of the other bugs. So step one, uh, replicate locally and in test. Step two, write the simple solution. Uh, step three, and I'm glad Kenzie highlighted this earlier, uh, rewrite the code to be highly readable and extendable. Uh, readable code makes it much easier for someone to 
add on to your code in the future without introducing or reintroducing uh, some bug that you had already squashed. Um, and so there's, there's a bit of audience participation, which you're welcome to do, or welcome to stare at me in abject horror as I do it. Um, and it's the squashing of the bugs. So I'll do this one, and if you want to jump in on the next ones, you can. <laughs> That's good. That's a good stomping stage. Uh, so now we're ready for upsettingly observable bug number two. Um, and its observable attributes are, how does this work? Does this work? Wait. What is this even testing? And more worrying, did this ever work? <laughs> if you answered yes or huh or oh no to all of those, you might have a Schroden bug on your hands. A Schroden bug is a bug that, like Schrodinger's infamous thought experiment, uh, you cannot confirm the validity of without observing it directly. Um, so it looks like a stick, and it has appendages that look like twigs, uh, and it likes to pretend to be working code, but on closer inspection, it reveals itself to be a bug. Um, and so there's two types of Schroden bugs that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, there's those that never worked, and then there's, oh, sorry, there's those that never worked, and those usually reveal themselves via side effects. Um, a common hiding spot for a Schroden bug is in return values. Uh, you complete a function or save something, and in the function with a return value, you can actually obscure the true results of that function. Type two, oh gosh, who made these slides? These are awful. Um, and so in the wild, you know, you might see this um, where like the UI shows an update immediately after the user inputs something into a form, but it never gets past the database because it never gets saved correctly. And it looks like it's working to the user because they see it in the UI. Uh, now, finally, we're on type two of the short bug, and that's code that doesn't work how you thought. Um, you can see that the data reaches the correct state eventually, uh, but it's not quite right. And this uh, manifests itself in call counts. Um, you see maybe the same function, maybe a validation uh, function, being called multiple times. And the first time, maybe it puts the data in the right state, and then it sort of uh, gets it saved on the third or the fourth time, maybe, instead of the first time. So you're calling the same path several times before you actually execute correctly. So remember these basic reproduction and resolution steps? Um, you're probably thinking, Kylie, be reasonable. How can I reproduce this without knowing exactly what's happening? Well, good news. Like I said, debugging, oh, oops, forgot about that. Uh, debugging is the developer's toolkit, right? So let's add a tool to your toolkit. We can use logging to verify what's actually happening. So when you have a bug that seems to be doing the right thing, but doesn't, um, you can use logs. Uh, add logging on save update features to indicate why the value wasn't saved, and add logging at the different uh, various areas where uh, their data ma manipulation occurs to see what your value is at a certain time and why. And that's good for both type one and type two. For board, goodness, <laughs> uh, for shortened bugs that seem to have worked at some point, you can use get bisect. Um, get bisect, you can compare your current bad state to a previous good state when you thought it was working again. And this is extremely valuable because it will help you from reintroducing maybe an earlier bug that was in your code. Um, and you can use this to find out when if ever this code actually worked. So, reproduction and resolution. Reproduce the broken state locally and in test. Add lock statements until you can verify what causes the broken state. If the bug did work at some point, find that point at which it did work, use a get bisect, and then we can follow the bore bug instructions. All right, ready? All right, not really enough, but that's okay. Um, let's get on to wildly chaotic bug number one. And what are its observable attributes? Does it appear non-deterministic? Maybe it appear, doesn't appear on every server, or um, it doesn't appear on every request. Uh, does it seem to disappear once you try to observe and debug it? If you answered yes to this question, you might have a Heisenbug on your hands, kind of a now you see it, now you don't. Uh, Heisenbugs are characterized by their seemingly inability to be reproduced. Uh, once you try to observe it through um, recreation, you might not actually be able to find it again. And a Heisenbug in code, 
uh, or there's two types, I guess. There's a Heisenberg encode and um, a Heisenberg, gosh. Um, awful slides, really garbage slide creator. Uh, and so there's two types. There's the first that lives in code, and it often occurs because debugging statements like print can affect um, if, if a function's actually evaluated or not, um, and it can actually throw off the timing of execution as well. So um, sometimes this can be a result of statements that are only evaluated when called, so adding a print statement forces eval when eval wouldn't have occurred otherwise. Um, type two Heisenberg, we have a Heisenberg that lives in data or data of size. Uh, and this bug seems hard to reproduce because you can't and you really shouldn't and please don't download user data to your personal machine uh, to recreate the steps. So you probably don't realize exactly what's causing the problem because you can only see the bug on production. And you're saying, how can I produce this without testing on prod? Well, I'm glad you asked because I've got another tool for you. Um, and it's profiling, which you can use to verify exactly what's happening at each point. Um, and you can use it to find out the length of time on an execution of, a, of some function or some call on prod. Uh, so you can turn on profiling using whatever profiling tool you have on your system. Um, and then it prints out this, which is fun and easy to read to everyone. Right, uh, but there's actually a better way to view this, I think, fairly quickly, using uh, what I feel is the original version of the infographic, flame graphs. And so you can see at the bottom of this flame graph, uh, the thing at the very bottom is the first function or class that's called, um, and it, all of the classes that are, or functions that it calls goes up, and the amount of space that it takes um, horizontally, that is how much, um, that's how much time it takes to finish execution. So um, for a Heisenberg of type one, uh, profiling can reveal what's being called and when. Um, so you can find out what's going on without affecting eval or timing with those pesky print statements we talked about. For type two, profiling can, realize, uh, can reveal, sorry, maybe how much time is being spent. Um, if uh, there's a query that's very expensive that's taking a long time or a big data set that's not optimized that it maybe could be optimized so that it doesn't take so much time and gum up the request. So reproduction and resolution. Uh, use profiling to find, what, uh, find the trigger state. Uh, use the app, not fixtures or manipulation, to get this data in the state, which is difficult, but kind of just wait for a user request, or if you have a test user that you can use, um, you can make that request then. Um, and then remember to turn off profiling because profiling will eat up your disk usage and we'll talk about that very soon. Um, and then recreate that state in test. Now uh, you've turned your Heisenberg into a bore bug. Uh, so follow the bore bug instructions and squashed, excellent. All right, so now we've got wildly chaotic, chaotic bug number two um, and it's observable attributes. Is everything broken? All of it. Send help. Um, if you answered yes, or I don't have time for these questions, <laughs> to these questions, you might have a mantle bug on your hands. And the mantle bug is, um, it's named after its resemblance to the Mandelbrot set, which is a mathematical set that is seemingly random when you plot or graph it, but the set itself is just a collection of complex numbers, and those numbers alone that are the single factor in creating like the highly convoluted and sometimes beautiful, depending on the artist, not this artist, uh, fractal that we see. So this is an attempt, unknown artist at a fractal. Um, so it seems like everything's broken, uh, and as a result of that, people are very upset with you and you're under a pressure to really get things done. Uh, I have good news, um, it's likely an issue with your system and not your code. Um, and I'm sure you're thinking, excellent, I'll pass this off to ops. <laughs> no, 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 you can do more. You can do more exploratory work. You can fix this. Um, so let's look at uh, maybe a, a sample on-call log from a specific um, Mandel bug that could have happened to anyone and not this presenter. Um, everything's broken, right? But that's okay. So let's just see if we can access your servers, yes? All right, I have an idea. If jobs aren't running, emails aren't sending, submits and saves catch fire, uh, and nothing saves, 
Let's check your disk usage. Uh, did you forget to turn off profiling earlier? Did you add too many log statements? Uh, those things go somewhere, and it's not dev null. Um, <laughs> Uh, those things will take up your disk usage very quickly and very happily. So let's see if there's any one file or folder or directory or whatever taking up all of your um, disk usage. And we can use df-h, which presents this in uh, a human readable format for some definition of human and, and some definition of readable uh, that I don't necessarily agree with, but I also don't write these tools, so who am I to judge? Um, and we can also use logging as verification again. I'm sure you're thinking, Kylie, this got me into this mess. Well, um, actually, let's just check to see when was the last entry. Was it around the time that things stopped, started blowing up? All right, well, at least now we have an exact point in time we can reference and let customers know, hey, everything might have stopped working at this time. Any actions you've taken in the application, you'll have to redo them once we fix and give them maybe a projected ETA for fix. So. Reproduction and resolution. Uh, use df-h to find out if, if all the storage is being used. Um, attempt to connect the server and view logs. And can that be restarted, rotated, or killed at this time? Um, is it on the next slide? No, it's on this one. Okay, there we go. We're here together. Uh, so now I think we're ready to squash this Mandel bug. Excellent. So. Please keep working. Please stop doing that. Please stop working. Wary. No. No, we have to do it again. All right, either way, we've got a practical taxonomy of bugs, and we've talked about how to squash them. Hell yeah. All right. Um, so I'm sorry if I've squashed your uh, hopes of becoming a unicorn and developing your debugging instincts, uh, but you don't need that because you've got a debugging toolkit now. I'm giving you my tool. You know how to observe and classify. You know how to verify with logging and time travel. Um, you can verify without changing the state by using profiling, and you're comfortable using server tools to check out the entire process. So. This is my toolkit, but I encourage you to build up your own toolkit and share it with your team, because I'm sure your company or your project or your application is just as complex and confusing and unique as mine. Um, these are resources and for their study. I, they don't have a hook, but I'm imagining that they're getting one right now. So I'm Kylie Stradley. You can find me online at KaiFest. I work for MailChimp in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you so much.